And Liz wants to remind everyone that um, if you happen to uh, have fiddled with your microphone, make sure it's on <laughs> so we can hear you. Everyone there? Um, Jonathan, let's see. We have, uh, first we called the meeting to order. And in terms of our roll call, Jonathan is tied up in traffic and should be with us shortly. And Craig, unfortunately, will not be able to join us. But we are going to start and hope to see Jonathan soon. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming, as always. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention today is that uh, tomorrow is Veterans Day. And um, we owe a special thank you to all of our veterans our students and faculty and everyone who has served uh, in our military uh, for this country. So thank you all. Um, next thing we have coming up is recognitions. Anthony? Yes. SBCC has a longstanding tradition to recognize the longevity and dedication of our employees. and. Uh, this afternoon, we have Mary Saragossa, um, who's going to be recognized by all of us, and uh, Saul Kiros is here to, to give a bit of a presentation. So, Saul, we'll turn it over to you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Saul Quiroz, I'm the Director of Financial Aid, and uh, I have the sincere pleasure to, uh, to help present this Certificate of Appreciation uh, to Mary Saragossa, our Financial Aid Advisor, uh, to recognize her 15 years of service to our, to our office, to the Financial Aid Office, uh, and more importantly to our students. Uh, I've known Mary for almost 10 years now. Uh, in fact, uh, Mary helped train me when I first started in Financial Aid 10 years ago. And uh, I can honestly say that, uh, you know, she is a big reason why I was able to, to do well in my role here at Financial Aid uh, previously and why I was able to come back. Uh, very early on, it became clear to me that Mary was student-centered and that she always would be willing to go the extra mile for our students. And uh, it's something that has persisted throughout the time that I've known her. And uh, I'm really happy for her. And I know that... Uh, you know, she, she's hopefully not close to retirement because uh, she's a vital part of our office. And uh, I'd just like to thank Mary uh, for her years of service to our students and to our office. Thank you, Mary. That's the end. Okay, we have two others on our agenda who unfortunately were not able to come, but we thank them as well. Uh, we really appreciate the years of service that folks have put in here. Um, moving on to the minutes of the regular meeting of October 13th and October 27th. Do I have a motion? I so move. A second. Approval? <laughs> I move approval. A second. Veronica seconds. Uh, any questions, comments? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? One abstention. Abstention, not here. Yeah. I was not abstaining because I think you don't actually no, it's have kind to of a if funny you're not thing, here. Because you don't know about it, so you can't complain. Or but it's on videos, and I know, I know you looked at it, and so I did I. I watched it, and it was so. fine. So I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't abstain. I'll just say you're fine. If it makes you feel better, I approved uh, Luis Villegas' uh, fiscal minutes and uh, oh, go. Joan yeah, I looked at them. They look good. I didn't know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I'll just say yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what to do about almost nothing. Now we come to public comment. Angie, I have one slip here, but uh, that's it. Okay. And that agenda item is for 11.1, .1, so I think we'll skip till we get to 11.1.
Now, next on our schedule is a report from Jeff Green, and we seem to be missing Jeff temporarily. Oh. Da, 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 da. <laughs> I just texted him and uh, haven't received anything back yet, but <laughs> hopefully he got it. Well, maybe he's in the same traffic jam that uh, Jonathan is in. Could be. Could very well be. <laughs> this is possible. Um, Jeff does a lot of traveling for, the, for all of us. Um, okay, so that means we might as well move on. And that brings us to 5.2, which is a report um, from <coughs> Michelle. I would probably not do well with your last name. So, Giacomini. Giacomini. Okay. Michelle Giacomini from the Fiscal Crisis Management Assistant Team, whom we retained to give us fiscal advice and do some training. And uh, we'd like to hear now from Michelle. The report is attached to the agenda, and Michelle is here to give us her summaries and comments and answer questions. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. It's funny thinking about traffic in Santa Barbara because it's such, a, it's such a beautiful place where you live. So I live in Sonoma County and I think it's beautiful, but this is pretty splendid here. So <laughs> anyway, I'm Michelle Giacomini and everyone has a hard time with the name. I just changed my last name, so I keep forgetting who I am as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I work for FICMAT, which is the Fiscal Crisis and Management Assistance Team. A little scary title. We're not here because you're in crisis. We're here to give you an honest opinion of uh -oh. our opinion of where you are and where you're going fiscally if, if we don't talk about a few things. So that's what this very long 25 page report is all about. Um, we were honored to spend time in your district. Your staff was very helpful. I will tell you that going through a FICMAT review is horrible. We ask for so many pieces of paper and um, I like to think that we're nice people but we do ask for a lot and a lot of questions and that's what you see in our reports is, is our honest, unbiased opinion and it is what it is and it's not always liked, but it's based on a lot of years in the field of what can and does happen in districts around the state. FICMAT since the early 90s has worked with K-12, community college and charter schools as well as County Office of Education. So we have um, quite a bit of experience and I will tell you almost everything that we do surrounds doing a multi-year projection, multi-year financial projections. And I think you've been talking about that quite a bit lately. And I would like to think that that's something you will keep talking about, our multi-year projections. I can't stress the importance of them enough. And I will tell you, you know, often I'll hear a board say to me, well, our multi-year projection keeps changing too much and it's really frustrating. And I wanna tell you that projection should change. Your budget should change. I'm sure that since that projection came to you, it's probably already changed based on things that we know now that we maybe didn't know two months ago. So I can't stress enough in your district. I, we found a lot of good information, but not a lot of it was known. A lot of good reporting, a lot of good analysis, a lot of good stuff, but I'm not really sure that the board and the stakeholders are aware of that data. Because really, if, if you look at um, where Santa Barbara has been, you are deficit spending. You have a large fund balance, and that is great, and you are to be commended for that. But fund balances are one time, and that's what we really see as a problem here is year, year, last year, this year, next year, the year after, if you look at the projections, that fund balance is something that you're gonna keep going after. And the reason is because your FTES, your enrollment has really dropped and you need to make some changes or decisions of how to stop that bleeding, which is really what's gonna start eroding that fund balance. It will erode. I know it seems large and it's interesting when I do reports like this because when I look at your fiscal health risk analysis, when I do a very honest opinion of today, you'll see there's only two areas that actually I said were at risk. That's deficit spending and FTES. But if you look at the other areas, the other 17, there are a lot of no factors in there. And that's because you're still okay, but you're close to not being okay. I don't know that if I were to do this report next year, if you weren't to make any changes, enrollment policy decisions, determining 
what the right size for this college is, how we're gonna decrease expenses, you know, a lot of things that you need to do. I think I would probably have to evaluate a little bit differently in a year, but I don't think that we're gonna have to, right? Because there's a lot ahead of you that you have to decide about, and there is still time, and that is what that fund balance does for you. Not all districts have that. Fix, FICMAT's role is a funny one. Most of what we do is assistance, which is here. You know, a district invites us in. We come in, we give our opinion. The horrible part of my job is the other 10% of what I do, which is the crisis part. And under crisis, what happens when I come and speak to a board, it's not giving advice as much as almost telling you, you have to do it now. And you have to do it now because if you don't, somebody else is gonna make that decision for you. A lot of boards will say to me, you know, how did we get here? Why do we need outside help? Whether it's from the chancellor's office, Department of Ed, wherever it is, and it's because the tough decisions weren't made. If you run out of money, or if you get very close, and I know you seem like you're away, away from that right now, but I want you to add this year's deficit, next year's projected deficit, the year after that, look at your enrollment decline. It, it will bring you in a path where somebody else could be up here one of these years saying you have to do this, it's not a choice anymore. So that's the dire stuff. The good stuff is you're doing well right now. You have good staff, you have dedicated staff. I think that you have the capability to, to understand the numbers, but I think you need to talk about the numbers more. Budget isn't exciting, I get that. It's like really good nighttime reading actually. Um, ask my husband, he's tired of hearing about funding formulas at FTES. But you know, budgets can be exciting if you really think about what we're trying to do is every time we make a budget decision or we spend money, we are making decisions about the future. And that's really what your multi-year projections are. So what you really have to think about is statutorily, you are not required to bring multi-year projections forward that often statutorily, but I don't really care about what statute is and your staff might wanna kill me right now, but multi-year projections should be redone whenever big decisions come up so you can see what the numbers will look at like in two years. I will tell you, a multi-year projection is looking at today's decisions, the impact it will have in the out years. And it's hard to make decisions about this year if we don't know what it's gonna do in the out years. And so that's what deficit spending is. <laughs> Our costs increase on the natural right, stirs, purrs, we have step and call we have things that go up every year with our contracts, but there are the other costs that we can control. And so that's what's under your power for this. So good news is low risk, that's excellent. And I don't always get to do that when I'm called in to assess the district, but I just would like to put a big but after that, mm -hmm. but you need to pay attention. And so I, I hope that um, you will just take it with a grain of salt, read through the 25 pages. I know it's not that exciting, all of it. Take the good with the bad, and right now there is more good than bad, but um, I, would, I would caution you to really pay attention to the future. Okay. So I think the questions would be okay. best. Well, first I wanted to thank you, Michelle, as well. Um, particularly, I think, for the, the training you give us and the training you gave our staff on these budget projections. Um, it, it is something that was a priority for a while now with our fiscal subcommittee, and um, it was particularly sharpened by seeing a number of things coming together, like the per stirs increases and the dropping enrollment and, um, the possibility that uh, Prop 30 funding would go away. Fortunately, we have the sales tax is going away, but the income tax part is not. Uh, and um, all of those things were kind of moving parts, so we wanted to, to see where they led us, and, and you really helped us with that. Thank you. No, and there are a lot of moving parts, and there will continue to be a lot of moving parts, right? I mean, this projection, again, probably is not even valid anymore, right? It, things keep changing. You're getting new... Um, uh, you're getting new estimates in, new things are happening every day, you're having conversations, but thank you um, for that. Your staff really was receptive, and, I, and like I said earlier, there was a lot of information in the business office. I just think it wasn't really talked about a whole lot out in the public. Okay. Um, folks, any questions? Marty? Yeah, I just had a quick one. I um, just got back from a long vacation, so I kind of read this quickly. Uh -huh. um, but um, the financial, 
the long range financial plan that we're looking at, and I think it's a great idea, and we've been asking for that, but um, um, so, so would you recommend like five years? Is that a reasonable? I know if, I, if we did a 50 year plan, it would be ridiculous, because we'd spend so much time on the 40 to 50 years, it's ridiculous. Absolutely. But, but five years or 10 years, or what do you think? Um, to be honest with you, yeah. I think going out much further than five is not okay. as helpful. I mean, we could do past five, right? We can keep guessing, yeah. but it really is guessing at yeah, that point. Yeah, it gets worse and worse. This it one. it, it does. Oh, it's always going to yeah. get worse, let's be clear, <laughs> because everything we're doing today ends up costing more next year. Yeah. So that's the hard thing. But it's also hard to know six years out very good assumptions of how to base a projection on. Yeah. Um, and so the better your assumptions, the better your projections. And so each year you should look at it and have a rolling five years? So each the, year the next you year you'd have five, but you'd have added one, is that? Okay. And then during, this, during a year you would update that projection several times. Okay. Um, K-12, you're actually required to update your projections. Yeah. Um, not saying that's the answer, but I think community college would be better based on the problems that I've seen in the different colleges I visited if they would do projection more often okay. not just deal with current I years. had a note somewhere and I don't know where it is now but um, that community colleges may be required to just like k-12 does now is there's that, not any current legislation maybe I just made that up. <laughs> I, that, that's my dream and okay, hope maybe um, not to be negative but there's nothing being discussed right now okay it um, just makes so much sense to me that that be done um, but we don't want to spend so much time on it that it's not, you know, it's not fruitful for us to do that. So yeah, it's that it's, a, a balance, it's a balance. Think? It yeah. is a balance, and just like a budget, you know, a lot of a lot of districts want to do zero-based budgeting, where you kind of take yeah. the whole budget and start over. A lot of work, but it's not something you have to do every year if you really take the time to do it right the first yeah. time. The same I, with a projection. I think we did that when five years ago was it? I think Marcia? you tried. I think oh, we, we tried, but their comment didn't was it there. didn't really. Yeah. I don't know exactly. that you ever really, didn't really got there. And it is hard. Let's let's not yeah. downplay the work. Oh yeah. my! Um, but then you know your budget better than you ever have. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I don't think you got all the way there. Okay, Peter. <laughs> to to what extent is this community college district unique? To what extent <laughs> is this community college unique? Are we unique in, in California, for example? I, I'm, I'm imagining that we're not, but I'd be interested oh, good, in sorry. knowing if- you're expecting a really wise answer to <laughs> that. Yes. Um, no, I mean, I think you're uni unique with your fund balances right now. I think you're unique. Um, oh, that's a positive mm -hmm. unique. Oh, that's a pot. yeah. Do you want a bad unique? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, I, wa I'm, I'm, <laughs> I don't want us to have a bad unique. Probably but come I, up with something. I, 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 I mean, I don't, you're not different. What's happening to us must be happening to lots of other districts. Yes, but no. The other districts, uh, many of them, who, when they start deficit spending to this degree, have come up with plans to stop it. That's what you, that's that's the mm. bad unique where you are right now. I I don't see serious un, unless I missed it, really serious discussions on the future with enrollment. How are we going to deal with the negative, the large decline in enrollment? What are we going to do different because we can't deficit spend at this amount? You are unique in that regard that you haven't had that discussion. Stick Far. around. What? Yeah. You're getting there. Yeah. Well, I, I would say you're part of getting us to that discussion. It's hard to have someone from the outside be bossy and, and you know, do all this. I have six sons. You can tell that's how I talk to people. Sorry, a lot of boys in my house. Um, and so I'm very bossy. But it's better to hear it from me now, right? And so um, that's why Thick Mats kept me along, around for so long, is I'm very honest. Yeah. So it is what it is. Um, Veronica? I mean, for me, at the, I think for us at the board level, and I want to talk to my my board members, you know, on page 17 where it says, anecdotally, it appears as if we discuss the budget, but in reality, we don't really understand budget changes. And one thing that I thought about that we made a step, I think, in to, to make progress on that when we said, let's put the whole subcommittee thing on hold and let's make sure we're all on the same page and understanding the same information. Because I, I think that I, I agree with the yes and no. Yes, we get it, yet no, we don't, and it's not that we don't, but it's because collectively seven give direction to Dr. Beebe, so if collectively we're not all on the same page, I think it kind of 
does. So I agree with you and I appreciate that because I think that, um, which is why we moved in that direction. So I was happy that we had moved in that direction prior to you yeah, telling us yeah. that we should do something. My writers hated the yes and no, because it's like yes or no, and I'm like, no, it's kind of yes and no. Yeah, yeah. and then the other one, um, you know, our policies, how, it, you know, on uh, page 19, where it states that they're meant to be a framework, not just co copy paste, that's your policy. And so I think for us, that's an area where I think we can spend some time in really looking at what direction do we wanna provide, given that we have to look at enrollment, si size of the college, and just these different areas that really are our level that will really help Dr. Beebe as he then works with staff. Um, and so those are the only two things I think for us as board members is would be a right away thing for us to do. Marianne. I just want to note. Is your, is your mic on? I just want to note to uh, you and to all of us that almost every one of these recommendations involves the future. And we're really gonna have to work on that because I think that's not something I mean, it, we wanted to do it, and we've done it once in a while pe me, piecemeal, but we have never actually approached it as a coherent look at the future, financially or in other ways. And uh, your recommendations, I think, are very useful in that way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I do think in community colleges, we find that a lot, that we're not always thinking of the future, and a lot of that is because we don't have to do multi-year projections. We don't really talk about the future as much as what's happened and what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's a brave step, but it's also really a necessary step. Um, it's not easy, and they are policy decisions. They really are, so that your staff then knows what, what to go forward with in the future. Those, those are the hard decisions for you guys to make though that policies and making sure then the policies are followed mm -hmm. and i can't tell you how many colleges well education wise just throughout all the ranges we have a lot of board policies throughout the state that aren't followed they look really really good mm -hmm. but i don't know how well a lot of them are communicated and then followed so that that's the other difficult part of passing policy making sure we do it I'm smiling because we just revised oh. our policies. It was, a, what, four years it took us in a, a small committee, and we finished the board policy. And then policy. I saw the um, administrative procedures you thought we should develop, and I just thought, I don't think Pat English is <laughs> too happy about that, and we love to keep her happy. So it's, it's hard for us yes. because we just spend so much time, but I can see that we might need to look at that and, and fill yeah. it in for us. I think the time we did spend was really good time. Oh, it was. And, it and was, fruitful. but we didn't know starting out. I thought it was going to be a one-year committee. Yeah. So my little hand went up, but <laughs> it was four years, and that was okay. Live and learn. Yeah. yeah, I could have gotten a degree from Harvard or something. Yeah. <laughs> or not. Yeah. So anyone else? Well, Jonathan. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at the one, number 17, the internal controls one, where you say, like, we don't have an internal auditor enough internal controls. Do you think that having that would have helped us detect what's going on earlier, or how much of a priority would it be to implement something like that? I, so I'd love to tell you that I think having an internal auditor would have made a difference with what I'm talking to you about with multi-year projections. I don't. Mm -hmm. um, internal auditors, um, first of all, because you are fiscally independent, that, that's why we have that comment in your report um, really is required. But it helps, that helps more with the controls of today. Projections are really more not something the internal auditor would be involved with usually. It would be your CBO, other business budget staff. Um, so they're related on fiscal health issues but not related for, the, for internal controls versus multi-year projections. They're very different areas. Okay. Uh, but how much of a priority would it be? Because you say that we don't have this. Oh, I think you need to do it all. Like, okay. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> right away. Like, get this done right away. Okay. Um, you know, so I would work on your projections before the internal auditor. Okay. One's a position, though, and the other is a process. But if, if I had to pick one, mm -hmm. it would be the projections. Okay. Yeah, I think that's your – I really think that that's more of an immediate problem than, than might be realized just due to your fund balance. Thank you. Uh-huh. 
Uh, the, just following up on that particular one, so it's, it would be a new position? Does it mean that that's a full-time position? That's so because you're fiscally independent, an internal auditor would normally be a full-time position. For within the college? Within the college. A, an additional yeah. mm -hmm. expense. Okay. Yes, it would be an additional expense. How many colleges do fiscal independence? I can't tell you off the top of my head. I would okay. be totally guessing. Okay. Um, but even if you're a K-12 school district and you're fiscally independent, I worked for one, we had to have an internal auditor. Um, so it is part of the requirements. Once the county stops auditing your information, that you should have one on board. Even if you had a half-time internal auditor, that would be better than nothing. Right. Well, the required word catches my yeah, attention. Yeah, it should. It should. And, you know, obviously your auditors, your annual independent auditors haven't had a problem with that, but, but I think you should think about it. It okay. is part of being fiscally independent. Yeah. Worked for a district that uh, was not independent and, and ran things through the county just for economies of scale and, and ended up saving money in that sense. But we also had an, an independent auditor as well. I mean, just within the district. Even though you ran through the county? Even though we ran through the county. Yeah, I, I, the other hat that I wear a lot are fraud audits. So um, I can tell you a whole different discussion in th that we weren't here to look at internal controls at all. So, but it, that whole issue of internal controls, internal auditor, it's, I can't stress the importance of it because there's just a lot that can go wrong in our entities, a lot. And I know we absolutely do not want things to go wrong there. No, mm -hmm. you do not. Yeah. And, you know, God forbid that they hopefully aren't, but sometimes we just don't know. More questions, folks? How about folks in the audience? Anybody have any additional questions? Okay. Um, can you can you come down so it will be on the, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a terrible room for this, but I, if you, Give us the question from back there. No one will hear it. Yes. So do you want me to repeat the question? Yes, okay. let's do that. So the question really is, is, is there really a good clearing, I'm going to use a, a weird term, clearing house, for, for budget uh, policy that's out there, for good budgets that are out there, good board policy? And I will tell you, not really. There's really not. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you really have to go almost district by district and look at what they're doing. It's not a good answer, but it's... So parts so of it. Repeating the question. So it would be good. It would be good. To, you know, CCLC and other entities that do consulting would be good to have a clearinghouse. Um, I agree to a point. I think that you know board policies that there can be templates of general ideas, but every college is different, just like every budget is different. So, you know, the chancellor's office after the governor's budget and after the May revise and after will put out some budget assumptions, right? You know, what's happening with the COLA, what's happening with different pieces with revenue. Um, but they can't go through all of the budget. Any one entity couldn't do a good draft of budget assumptions because we're all so different. The classes we offer, our populations, our size, are we increasing in <coughs> FTS, are we decreasing? What does our salary schedule look like? So. I think that's probably why there's not a clearinghouse on budgets assumptions because it'd be pretty hard to come up with a generic budget assumption, in my opinion. So I think then we'd probably start cookie cutting it too much. But that's me. I so I have a couple of questions, and in part, these are questions that I think may help members of the public or the larger community see what's going on. Um, in your recommendations. And um, you used the word dire, and, and I see that in our projections. Um, and I understand your recommendation to be based on it's dire if mm -hmm. 
-huh. We don't reduce expenditures to fit our revenues. We have had dropping enrollment, increasing expenditures, and, um, and deficit spending, which we have been doing, eating into our reserves. Uh, you mentioned that they seem large, but I looked back and uh, I think it's 12, 13, they were some 48 million. 10% over six years, 10% de decrease in your reserves. That's yeah, pretty huge. I was huge. doing the numbers on the plane this well, morning. Well, I think it's like even bigger than that because we had uh, substantial reserves of 7 to 10 million in our equipment and okay. construction as well. Even so it's not like even general fund. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. No, it's and it's we've huge. spent those down. Mm -hmm. So we have spent roughly 40 million since 12, 13 out of reserves. And that's a lot. Um, so. <laughs> There should be a building <laughs> at the end of that. Well, that's no, good perhaps yeah, what we're that's talking awesome. about. Um, so those two things, reduce our ongoing expenditures to fit our revenues and the deficit spending. And there's another piece of it that I'd sort of like you to expand upon a bit, and that's enrollment management. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen in your report, for example, on City College of San Francisco, comments about managing enrollment to targets. Um, and having to do with efficiency. And I'd like maybe for you to tell us a little bit about what that means and why it's important. Right. Thank, no, that's a, thank you. Um, enrollment management is a funny thing, right? Because we often think of enrollment management just as what classes are we going to offer to attract enrollment. But sometimes we have to look at that a little differently because we also have to look at that within the money that we have bringing everybody together at the college and defining what are the right classes to offer based on our population but also based on what we can afford so sometimes that has to do in some places and City College was a good example um, they had so many different facilities open I mean that sometimes there's th other things we have to look at besides the classes we're offering at some colleges I've seen um, also that the classes that are offered and we didn't look at enrollment management in detail here at all um, so I'm not at all talking about this college, but some colleges I visited, the classes that are offered are very much about what the instructors want to offer and not as much as about what the, what the I say kids, I just turned 50, so everyone's a kid right now, what the students really want to attend. And so enrollment management is much bigger than what classes we're offering, it's how we're offering them and how we can best fit the needs of everybody within a certain budget, but within the budgets and and is that reflected in measurements of efficiency? Because I've seen you and I've seen actually, referring back to the earlier question, I've seen some board budgets, I think City College in San Francisco was one of them, where they said we will manage to a specific target of efficiency as part of our budget assumptions. Um, and critical, right? Because the, the other piece of enrollment management is setting those targets and then really looking at how efficient are we, are we reaching our goals? Um, so it's a much, it's again, bigger than just writing a policy on what we want to do. It's on how do we manage it. I think you have all of the pieces already in the college, you know, and I think that um, a lot of your staff already talk about enrollment management, but, but there probably isn't that clear direction on, on what it is, where are we going, and what is it we're supposed to do with it. So that could be part of our conversation with Dr. Beebe. He could recommend to the board as we think about our budget assumptions to think about this. Anthony? Just a quick comment on that. Uh, Dr. Jarrell and I have been talking about just uh, having even a five or ten minute kind of update on enrollment management and kind of efficiencies or whatever it might be at every board meeting. That's the business that we're in. Why shouldn't we be talking about that? And, and uh, you know, we'll have at the retreat, um, you know, we'll set our targets with Paul's uh, data and information that we've been working on, um, which relate to the size and the composition, the portfolio of the, the kind of courses that we're offering, whether it's credit, non-credit, international, you know, all of that. Um, but then be able to track that and, and how close are we coming to those particular targets that we've set. So I think that would be a worthy uh, bit of time for us to take at each board meeting. And then you could really see your progress, which would be wonderful. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes when we're not watching our progress or the metrics or whatever term we're going to use, we forget that we really are making progress. Or we forget we aren't able to see as well where we are and where we're not. 
Um, I think in education, we don't think of it that way, but we have goals to meet as well. Um, and one of those goals for a, a board is staying solvent. And so all of this kind of, there's my Italian, all of it kind of comes together. And enrollment management is very, very important. So it being on your agenda each time would be a really, make your meetings a little longer, but it would be fine. It would be good, really good. Make it a priority. I think there was a question over here. Cornelia. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. yes. Um, yes, thank you so much for um, letting me ask a question. I had, I, it was more like uh, confirming that I understood the last two paragraphs of, on page 22 correctly. So um, your recommendation is when you are describing reasons why we lost enrollment and why we lost student and why we lost FTS, your recommendation is that we are bringing back out of district um, outreach, that we are bringing back non-enhanced, non-credit classes. Your recommendation is that we are bringing back more out-of-state and international students, or at least making efforts. You know, I, I know you, you cannot just turn the faucet on and they are all coming back, but that we are increasing our efforts again, which we did pull back significantly in the past. Is, mm -hmm. Did I understand that correctly, that this is your recommendation? No, I don't have a recommendation. I mention each of these because they're all important to consider. And for a lot of them, the numbers have gone down, but the expenses haven't necessarily gone down. So it's a balance. So whatever you decide your right sizes, what populations you're reaching, what, po what, what classes you're gonna offer, my recommendation isn't at all specific on what you should do. That's not my job at all. But if, these, if your FTS and enrollment continues to decline because of any policy decisions, which I think there have been some, then your expenses are gonna have to decline as well. But I'm not recommending that you put anything back. I'm recommending that you make some decisions and mm. put it in policy and move on. And those policies have to do with targets for efficiency, targets for the mix of students, the sources of FTS that we hope for, and the kind of measurement that Dr. Beebe was just talking about. Say, how are we doing? What are we seeing? Um, what are our priorities for becoming the size that we think we should be? And that's a decision that, that you get to make, right? I mean, that, that is a very exciting place to go as a college of what that will look like but then it's coming up with the whole plan that goes along with it. Um, to go back to the ending deficit spending and reducing our expenditures question, um, do you envision that it will be necessary to lay off permanent staff or employees? Um, how do you like the word maybe? Because maybe it really depends on what you decide to do to cut your costs. Y you can't have everything you have now when it comes to programs and staff. So something has to go. Do I imagine a layoff? No. But could I immediately say 100% that you won't have to based on, I don't know what decisions you are going to make to reduce your staff, to reduce your costs. Sometimes it is staff. You have a big retirement plan going right now. That will help in that area as well. And then that's reducing positions, but not people, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that we can do. And that, that's what you're, so I, it's hard for me to say yes or no. That one is definitely a maybe. You can't afford to do everything you're doing now, though, I will tell you. Okay. Um, and perhaps last, um, knowing what you know about our most recent projections, um, which include a $9 million deficit unless we close that gap for next year uh, and more following, um, and we have before us a decision about today about a uh, campus center, a new campus center, on which the bids came in at uh, $7 million over what the original estimated cost was. Um, what would you recommend, given our situation at this point? Do you 
feel that we can take on that additional. It's also a low bid project for which we do not have a good track record in cost overruns, and no, that's all on us. Yeah, no, you don't. Um, honestly, I would have to say I wouldn't do it right now. I think that if you were to add another $7 million negative to the budget that you already have, so I'm going to assume that part of it's already budgeted, but this additional seven isn't, and there's That's still correct. no guarantee. It's just another seven million. I think. Mm -hmm. um, until you get the rest of the house in order and figure out your plan of where you're going, to add another seven million dollar deficit to, let's let's say it's to next year. So nine plus seven, then more after that. Your fund balance isn't looking very good anymore, is it? So I, I would say you have to make other decisions first. I. Mm -hmm. I don't know a lot about the project, and so it's probably not a very popular answer I just gave. But it's it's hard for me to say yes, you should increase your deficit spending by seven million because that's what you would be doing. And my whole thing with you is you have to eliminate deficit spending, not add to it. Okay. Well, thank you. Any more questions? Anybody? Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you for having me. Um, one of the things that we talked about was the fiscal issues, putting these fiscal issues more or less together. And Campus Center is a big fiscal issue for us here, as well as uh, all the considerations that come to it. So what we talked about was moving forward on our agenda 11.1, .1, which is the decision on the Campus Center, uh, for us to um, look at now and first step on that would be to hear from our person who wants to, uh, has signed up for public comment. So, um, Albert Jacomin, oh, you, you spelled it out for me and I still blew it, but. Jack O. Mozzi. Okay. And you're from AMG Associates? We were the uh, low bidder for ah. your project. So okay. um, I wanted to talk to you about your project. Um, I've been listening to your report, understand the financial challenges that you're experiencing. Um, a little bit about AMG. We're a contractor in Santa Clarita. Uh, we do primarily... 95% uh, public works, um, a lot of work for, um, currently I have $42 million worth of work for El Camino College District. Um, we bid other universities. We did a photovoltaic system at UCSB on top of a five-story parking structure. This is our forte, this is what we do. Um, I know your project very well. Um, beautiful building. Very, very attractive building uh, as far as a statement to the campus. It would be incredible. Um, you do have some challenges uh, as it relates to cost. I, I get it. Um, the current climate in the industry is um, there is a lot of work in the industry going on right now. Um, with the $9 billion bond program that was passed, um, the climate is not going to improve. Um, the pricing that you received for your building and the design of your building is competitive. Um, the cost per square foot is high. Um, and a lot of that <coughs> has to do with various components that you have um, for the building. I've gone through and analyzed um, some of the big ticket items that could be looked at, that could be value engineered uh, to bring the cost down. The challenge that you're faced with is you have part of the money is from the state and then part of the money is coming from the college district. Um, and I don't know enough about your funding without looking at your uh, form JCAF, JCAF 32 of how that funding is working. But overall, we think that there's about 7.8 million in value engineering ideas that could be looked at. The thing that's important for the building is to maintain the functionality of what the intended purpose was for the building and not to detract from that 
not to reduce in square footage. Um, because that's when you're working with the state. Those are some challenges that they're not going to be very receptive to. Um, we have extended an offer to Julie Hendricks. She and I have exchanged emails. I haven't met her. I don't know if she's here or not. <laughs> but um, uh, And we're happy to meet with, uh, with your facilities group, with your design team, with the construction manager to try to brainstorm ideas to see if your project uh, can move forward or not. Um, the uh, pricing that we received uh, from subcontractors, only a very, very small number is local. Uh, the major trades that came in um, for the work that's going to be performed come from the Los Angeles area, the Venturi area, uh, some in um, Santa Barbara and Santa Maria and Bakersfield. Um, there were no shortage of quotes, uh, meaning that um, we either received two or three trades deep. Um, when we are bidding a project, what we do is we have approximately 10,000 subcontractors signed up on our website. When we choose to go after and bid a project, we send out an e-blast to all the subcontractors and then they know what we're bidding and then they go to our website, download your plans and specs and the addenda and then start sending bids in to us. So um, you did get competitive coverage. So. Well, I, I appreciate your, your comments and the background that you have mm -hmm. on this and I know you've already put work into it. It, it doesn't, isn't easy to get to a bid on something like this. So. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm available so if you want to ask me any questions while okay. I'm here or, you know. Um, we don't normally have a lot of interaction on public comment things, but. Sure. Well, we could have a question. You yeah. could have a question. And mine, mine would be um, uh, just a, an interesting point that the value engineering number that you suggest is approximately the same as the deficit that we're looking at, which gives rise to the question of how solid is that? If you were sitting in my seat rather than standing there, what would you be asking? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, for example, um, I'll give you, when you do value engineering, basically what you're doing is you're taking a component from the building, and let's just say that of the sh um, uh, shades right here. What you would do is in order to value engineer them, you take those out and then you have to replace it with something that is gonna be less expensive. So for example, uh, the exterior building has uh, composite wall panels. That's terracotta wall panels, phenolic panels. Those are very, very expensive. The value for that alone is $1.8 million. You take that out and you have to replace it with something that is more cost effective. Instead of using a phenolic panel or a composite panel, you would do maybe stucco. So you're offsetting that value. And so you're not going to totally um, gain 7.8 million in value engineering. You're gonna reduce that cost down uh, so that the cost savings, you may end up getting 60% or 70% of it. And that's why the contractor, the design team, and the CM would collaborate and brainstorm solutions of what they would consider removing out and replacing with something that is not as expensive. Um, that's one aspect. The other one is the window system on your uh, building is $2 million. That curtain wall system around the radius part, I'm sure you've seen some renderings mm -hmm. of the building, mm -hmm. that component alone is $2 million. So what can you replace out? You could do partial windows. You can replace that with stucco, part of it with stucco. I mean, there are element, uh, building elements that do offer cost saving components. So yes, the value amount that I indicated, 7.8 million is nearly the amount of the uh, amount that you're over budget. 
but make sure that I am clarifying that, that it's not an equal dollar for dollar. You have to replace it with something, okay? So, but this is what we do. I mean, we, we, we have other projects that we're doing with other districts that we're faced with these same kind of challenges and it's a matter of bringing the team together to brainstorm solutions. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Marianne? Uh, this is not a question for you per se, but <clears throat> I've been thinking quite a bit about this and the fact that the last three years have been dramatic change years for this college. In terms of the number of students we're now serving and the kind of service we hope to provide <clears throat> and I am not sure that I am convinced anymore that the plans I, I'm convinced that we need a camp center that's not a question the question is more um, <clears throat> are we ready to actually discuss concrete which is why I'm mentioning this now, uh, concrete issues, or do we need to go back and look at what we would want the campus center for in the same way that we need to go back and look at what would we like the enrollment to be? Mm -hmm. Because I don't think they're matching anymore. Mm. I could be wrong about that, but <clears throat> the plans were done about three years ago and there have just been some very dramatic changes. I, I think that I, what I I'd like to do is say kind of move to the I item. I was gonna say, can we, now that we're done with public comment, can yeah. I move uh, well. in second so we can discuss the recommendation? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then yeah, here, and then elaborate more on what Marianne is bringing up right. so that now right. we can discuss. Okay, so let's move to 11.1. .1. Thank you You're for welcome. your public comments. Thank you. And, um, Veronica, you're making a motion that we reject the campus center bids. Is that correct? That's well, the recommendation we have before us. That's the recommendation, but it's on there as an approval. So we would just recommend to approve to second and then hear the recommendation and then vote approve based on the, the recommendation. recommendation to not accept the bids. Is, mm -hmm. I'm just trying to make it clear. Yeah. Yes. Yes, so I want to move to uh, move item 11.1 .1 to approve as recommended. Okay or so not approve. Do we have, no, and we're G moving approve. approve. We gotta go in one things. direction. <laughs> or we'll totally if we vote yes on 11.1, .1, we're approving the contracts? No. No. Well, you're rejecting so all So we're this. rejecting contracts, yes. So, we're, so then I am moving, I wanna move 11.1 .1 to approve the recommendation as stated. Okay. And so the question is now, do we have a second on that? I second. Marianne seconds. Now we have discussion and I'd kind of like to turn first to Anthony to give us some of his thinking on it and then let us uh, add in. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. Of course, you know, the, the campus center is, is a building that we all want to have. We need to have it. It's a signature building for us on the campus. It's absolutely critical um, and one that that we all, I don't think there's anybody that says that we don't need the building. Um, we absolutely do. We've been actually talking about either renovation or replacement of the campus center for about, well, actually more than a decade. I mean, if you go back in the history and, and look at the record, we've been talking about it for more than a decade. Um, and the renovation of the campus center was actually included in the Measure B that passed. Um, but the problem was that there were no state funds available for that project at the time, and so the college decided to uh, allocate approximately $4 million at the time to do some what was called light renovation to kind of bolster some things and, and do some work and uh, you know, make it so that we could use it for a little, little while longer. Um, and then over the, the next four years or so, several assessments of the building's condition were conducted. Um, then in about 19, or I'm sorry, in 2012, January of 2012, a cost summary was developed that was comparing the cost of, and you all will remember this, the cost of renovating it 
versus the cost of building it anew. And the cost of, of the renovation ended up being $16.7 million. And the cost of replacement for the building ended up being $20.3 million. And so those were the, the costs that were presented to you. And there was a $3.6 million difference between the two numbers. And so uh, your decision was that actually based on the fact that you had at that time $48 million in reserves, you said, okay, well, $3.6 million, we can do this. And you said, you gave approval to go ahead and replace the building. Um, we then uh, submitted the, the application to the state chancellor's office in July of 2012. And uh, funding then from the state uh, ended up coming in and, and it was agreed that you know, the, the college would pick up a third of that funding cost. Uh, the college selected RNT to provide professional services and workup drawings that were submitted to DSA. And um, in April of 2016, took a while, uh, DSA wasn't real fast in response, but you know, they were real busy at the time, obviously. Um, 2016, um, ultimately the estimate for construction using the state guidelines came in um, not including contingency, but they, came, they ended up at $24.7 million, which was $4.4 million above the, the cost that, the $20.3 million that you all used as a comparison for the remodel. So, I mean, it was, it was above that estimated cost, so $24.7 million. After approval from the Chancellor's Office, uh, the project was advertised in August, uh, of this year, 2016, a couple times it was advertised. Bids were, were due and received on October 11th, 2016. The lowest bid um, came in at 31.7 million. And as has already been pointed out, that's seven million more than the estimated cost of construction and 11.4 million more than the original analysis that was done in terms of the the renovation and replacement analysis that was done. Um, the board um, made the decision, uh, you know, I mean that, the, the replacement cost decision had to, to weigh heavy on, on everybody's minds and so that wasn't forgotten. A um, Couple reasons that have come up uh, over and over again in terms of why the cost estimates ended up being uh, so low compared to the actual bid numbers. And one of them was brought up in terms of, you know, we are isolated here in Santa Barbara. You know, so we have a cost factor that's added into that just because materials, labor, and such uh, has to come in from outside the area. Um, the other thing that was brought up was the, the fact that we have a robust economy right now in California. And so there are lots of projects going on all over. And so bidders can, can look around and, and they can um, really look for higher price projects, go for higher price projects because there's so much competition because things are so robust. Um, one of the things that has been interesting to me in looking at all of this is, is that when the, when the engineers were looking at the project in multiple fashions and in multiple uh, at multiple times, the perspective that they, they took in evaluating the building was a longer term perspective. Can we be in this building for the next 30 or 40 years safely? As opposed to can we continue to use the building for the next four to six years or 10 years? You know, kind of a, a, a different question when you ask an engineer that, that that question. I mean, is it is it good for 30, 40 years, or is it good for four to six years, maybe 10 years? That's a that's a different analysis. Um, and uh, we recently uh, had a chance to to walk through the building and look at various aspects of it. And I, and I see Jay Sullivan's here to uh, to to as witness to that. I mean, he he walked uh, walked us through the building and we took a look at it. Um, not from engineer's perspective, but just trying to understand what the actual issues of the building were. And uh, of course, we've got uh, a couple of the classrooms that, that leak. 
because of the, the patio above not being completely sealed. And so uh, we've got two of the classrooms that have been completely shut down and are not being used at all right now because of, of water in infringement and potential water damage that's there. Um, but in looking at the work that was done previously, um, that actually, actually Mr. Sullivan was, uh, was a supervisor over, um, in terms of uh, mitigating any kind of uh, shear aspects uh, of the columns that are there, they bolstered the, the they took out the damaged uh, concrete, uh, polished and sealed all of the rebar that was there, uh, put new uh, concrete around the base of, of those pillars, um, secured them to the, I don't know what the technical term is, Jay, but secured them to the, the base frame that goes, that runs along uh, uh, the bottom of the, of the pillars. Um, did an excellent, excellent job of, of that, that mitigation for those, uh, for those pillars. Um, my point is, is that although not ideal, we have a building that has function and use in it and that barring anything that, that we discover going forward and we're gonna continue to monitor this and, and get opinions and such about the condition of the building, but barring anything that says that it is, it is unsafe and that we shouldn't be in the building, um, my recommendation is, is that it should not be demoed and that we continue to use it, um, as Michelle points out, until we can get our ship righted fiscally and be able to responsibly say, yes, let's move forward. Um, just a response to the re-engineering aspect of this. Yeah, we can cut costs and we can, we can reshape the building and, and have stucco instead of something else and we can, uh, we can remodel things and, and such and use different materials, lower cost materials and all. But I go back to the fact that this is our signature building. This is our pride and joy, one of our pride and joys in this, at this college. This is a building that is used every single day by lots and lots of students. I don't think we wanna, we wanna remuddle this and cut back on cost to the extent that we end up with something that is, is not the, the glory that, that really it should be. And so all of that said, my, my recommendation is that we reject all bids um, and delay this project. I say delay because I want, we will do this, but we're gonna delay it at this point. That's my recommendation. Okay. Thank you, Anthony. Um, questions, comments, et cetera, Peter. Well, part of, part of the incentive for moving forward is that the state is a participant to a substantial extent, um, the extent of $20 million. Uh, does that go away? There's a, there's a couple of ways to answer that. The straightforward answer is yes. The other, there, I've been presented with a, a couple of strategies that could delay sending the money back. Um, in my opinion, I don't think we want to uh, risk our reputation with the state chancellor's office by, by playing games and delaying the sending of, of the money back. To write our ship and to get our fiscal house in order is going to take a few years. And um, that's if we get everything in place that, that we've been talking about relative to the FICMAT report, to enrollment management, to, to all the other things that we're talking about. It could be longer than that. And I think it would be grossly unfair and uh, to, to do anything other than be straightforward with the state chancellor's office and let them know that we simply cannot afford, based on comments that we just heard from FICMAT, in addition to our own uh, projections, we cannot afford to move forward with this project at this time. I mean, that's the straightforward answer. That's the only one that matters. Marty. Yeah, um, I have a couple things. I, I'm, will, I'm ready to vote for this um, 
for rejecting the bid. But um, my problem, I have two things. Um, when we were first talking about this, we got very excited about it. I took a little book into Julie because it was about the Italian stonemasons in Santa Barbara. They've done all those beautiful walls up on the Riviera, and uh, there's still some of their descendants here. And Butch Arnaldi is one who's, he's, he's a sheriff deputy. He ran for sheriff, but I don't know what his title is right now. But he said that his family, they still have the stone quarry, and his family would be willing to donate it to put on the outside of the building. And from what I can see, nothing happened, which I'm very disappointed because that makes it a signature building locally for us. And I think in the future, if it's two years or something like that, I think which could still be around or his children will be. And I think we need to look into this because it's, um, it's not only good for the community, but it's just, um, well, it's good for the community, but also it will save money on that exterior of the building. And, and they can point to it and say, look at the connection here. And I think it's really good. So there's that. And I'll bring you a book so you can look at it. Um, and I don't get anything from those books. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is, um, when we were hearing about the, and maybe uh, Jay will know about this, he, uh, when we were hearing about the problem with the dripping into the journalism rooms and all that, and we fixed those columns, um, there was also an issue of drainage. And as you face the building with the ocean to your back, on the east side of the building, on heavy rain years, which we haven't had any of, so we can't prove it anymore, but uh, there's like a, um, like a spontaneous little creek that comes up on that side. And we were talking about with the building um, in having to, in, if we wanted to just renovate it, we were gonna have to put in some kind of um, waterproofing or something like that along that, which was gonna cost a lot. And so what I'm saying is if we go with just, you know, what we've already done, and I'm happy with that, uh, and we do get the March Miracle rains, which we do once in a while, is that gonna be a problem? I mean, what I'd like to do is have this be at least a four to six year uh, solution while we figure out how to put up a nice building. Mm -hmm. So that's the drainage issue I'm not clear on. I just, you know, I don't think it was just that the um, patio wasn't draining right. It had to do with the, the land itself wasn't draining right. Okay, we can, we can certainly look into that. I mean, yeah. and you, you raise a good point um, in terms of we're not gonna just leave the building the way it is. There are things that we are going to need we to do. To We've got $11.8 million in reserve for the campus center. And certainly a portion of that can be used to bolster the building, do some things about you know, water flow and that kind, of, yeah. that kind of thing. So I mean, absolutely we're gonna be able to, to mitigate some of those problems in that sense. Yeah, sometimes it's just putting up a dam or something like that, putting up the waterproofing right there, you know. A very small scale, we had that on our side and, and they just pulled the little wall back and put up, you know, some black rubberized uh, stuff and then I don't know what they put in there. <laughs> and, and it was fine then. So that's what, um, you know, I think that kind of uh, fix has to happen. So it's good to, that we have that money. Um, one, I just wanted to bring up one other thing. Uh, this is a low cost, uh, low bid project. And um, with that, we know that with our track record, quite frankly, I'm just being out there. Um, although the, the estimates are that it, it's $7 million over. I just want to dispel the myth that there's some kind of connection between uh, the idea of being able to value engineer $7 million out of the project, now all of a sudden we're in great shape. That $7 million uh, above the cost of, of our estimate could very well be, after change orders and everything else are involved, $10, $12 million. So um, realistically, and that, that, that additional funding comes right out of our reserves. The state doesn't pick up a proportionate amount of that. It's not like they pick up two thirds of, of whatever is over. That that's all directly on us. And at a at a moment in time when <coughs> we can't afford to be taking on any more deficit, to have to add to that, it simply uh, would not be responsible for me to recommend that we move forward with the project. Well, as much as I want to. We saw do. that with the drama music building that just kept going and going, and we found new, you know. 
uh, they found rubble from the 1925 earthquake in there that they had to deal with and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, I think when you take on a building, you have to be ready for change orders. It's just the way that is. Peter. The <coughs> part me. of the justification for the state involvement had to do with correcting a seismically um, stressed building. And I, and I think we've taken remedial action to, to shore that up. Are, are, we, are we content that we have done what is necessary to ensure that that building is safe under, I don't know what specific circumstances or, or degrees of an earthquake that would happen? Do we, do we feel content with that? Over the short run, um, we're going to be continuing to monitor that, and that's part of the analysis that we will be, will be doing in, uh, in an ongoing basis. Um, in the short run, I feel comfortable enough to be able to say that, that you know, the building is safe. We've been using it. Um, one day we've been using it. All of a sudden we realize we can't afford it. Now the next day it, it's not safe. Um, I mean, in the short run, I truly believe, or I wouldn't be making a recommendation, that it, it's a safe building for our students, for our faculty, for our staff to be able to work in. Longer run, you know, that's an engineering uh, question. But as I say, we're going to continue to monitor this, and, and like, a, unless there's something that is absolutely clear and convincing that says we should not be in the building, um, we should be able to move forward with that uh, in its present condition with some, maybe some modifications that we can get from from folks that know about that kind of thing. Okay, good. Yeah, I would think Marty's comment, uh, just before we lose that thread about the um, part-time stream, um, it might, I wouldn't be surprised if the remedy for a use time frame of six to 10 years is different than the kind of remedy if you're saying, can I use it for 50 years? Absolutely. And, and there may be a real cost saving there that we can do something temporarily that works. Um, well, I was just going to say, I mean, Peter brings up a good point, and, and I myself, when I was looking at through our, um, just all our buildings, I mean, we, we just have old buildings, and I mean, the campus center was built, you said, 1965, so was Sports Pavilion, so was physical science, and so our campus just happens to have old facilities. Um, so yes, God forbid, uh, you know, a natural disaster would happen, but that, I mean, I think San Francisco has a really a new building right now, and if you've been watching the news, and it's like kind of tilting, and it's a brand new <laughs> building, and, and <laughs> citizens are concerned. So I just think that even with modern technology, you just don't know these things. Um, I just wanted to say that I appreciate um, the stewardship. I appreciate all the legwork, and this is something that we talked about it during our board retreat back in August. So this is over three months ago, and it the fact that you guys really ran with was just really a discussion, you know, what do you think? We don't know. Um, we're kind of thinking that there's a lot going on with the budget, but we haven't gotten in there yet. And so the fact that you really ran with that and I attended, you know, the, you, the budget forum on the 8th uh, that Lindsay gave. And so I just want to say I'm, I'm, I'm impressed and I appreciate all of the hard work um, mm -hmm. working with the FICMAC uh, and just your leadership and for the rest of the staff to be willing to take this deep dive to ensure that our community is proud of our buildings, that our community is part of our college, and that, um, yes, 20 million is taxpayer money, but so is the other, you know, 15, 29, all the other money that's on our budget. It's all taxpayer money, and so this is definitely, uh, it's not a no, it's just it's the not now, and that is the, um, I think it's a good decision to know that we are getting what our community deserves. And I love Paterna and on APS and yeah. the stone and all of that. So I, you know, if I'm expecting, you know, granite, I don't want uh, Formica. A and, and so I, I appreciate that you guys are thinking hard about this and that your recommendation was, um, was thought out. So thank you. Peter? Well, I was, uh, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, the difference in the buildings is that this one has been identified with specific seismic conditions that that require us to have a second look. Uh, the other point that I thought was really intriguing was um, Marianne's point, and I think Marsha had also made it, that, that what we had in mind when we agreed to demolish this building and create a new campus center 
had to do with, with specific needs that were visible at the time. And if those needs have changed or are changing, then what it seems to me we should engage in, and that's a low cost effort, is a discussion of what are those needs and how can they be met in a structural fashion. So that when the time comes, and I, I'm in agreement that th this is not our time, uh, that we, we will have a, a clearer idea about what, what we should be planning. Yeah, I would agree the, um, the conditions that came with this money included the same footprint and the same use of space. And times have changed. Uh, and I would be excited about mm. both, uh, about looking to the future for what we think we will need in those terms, uh, rather than look being stuck with do the same thing over again because it's m our money, <laughs> which the state is, is saying to us. So um, it's, uh, it's sad not to go forward. It's sad not to be able to afford it. But I think we also have to recognize we made some other choices with our money. We bought some other things already with our money. And we can't afford all the things we would like to have. 85% um, of our expenses every year are our people, our staff, our employees. And this is money, this 11.8 million, what's left of it anyway, we've, I think we've spent some, um, is our general fund educational money. It's not bond money. Mm -hmm. And bond money is normally what is spent for this kind of a project, for a major facility project. So we are taking our educational money, which we would normally put to our <coughs> educational programs and saying that's more important. It's not for me. Mm. Our people are more important for me um, for now. And I think we can do both, but I think we have to wait a little bit and focus first on getting our house in order, as we've discussed. Um, I just Emily. wanted to point out oh. the close connection between the first topic of discussion, which was student population, and this discussion. Yeah. And if we follow the advice we were given <coughs> about population planning, uh, then we will be more ready to discuss in more detail mm -hmm. the other issue. Yeah. <coughs> Emily, you had a comment too. I was just going to say uh, I wanted to kind of reiterate what Veronica said. This is not a no, it's just a not now. And I really appreciate that comment. Um, I think the student's concern was kind of behind the idea that not having a campus center is is not so beneficial to their success within our institution. So um, to know that their safety, you know, is obviously being considered, and to just put a just a stop, a temporary stop, in this um, planning is. A thank you for your recommendation because the students were just more concerned about the idea of not having anything all together. So to put that at rest and know that it's just not a no, it's just a not now, um, is a great uh, talking point while moving forward. Well, thank you, Emily. That's a good summary, really, for all of us. Any more comments? Jonathan, you haven't? Any? Everything's been said. Okay. <laughs> Do you have anyone else? Well, the question. All right, we're going to call the question on this. And it's uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No? So, Veronica's motion passes, and we are not approving the bids. Um, that, is Jeff hanging around, or he did he is. disappear He's on us? Right there. Hanging up there, there he is, <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> we missed you earlier, I'm sorry, but we're happy to see you now. But he should hear that we don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He did hear that. <laughs> so that was good. <coughs> uh, well, good evening, uh, President Croninger, members of the board, President Beebe. I, uh, so this is our standard quarterly report, uh, but it's got some bonus items in it. So I, I was going to uh, take a moment to just share some, some good news. Uh, we'll start with the basics, uh, the very exciting audit. Uh, so what I will just say to you is that we have completed our audit again uh, on time and I guess well on budget you don't really get <laughs> under budget audits but nonetheless uh, in time for your uses with the uh, consolidated audit 
And uh, if we go to page uh, three of the audit, if we could, Liz, there's um, a couple of things I'll just point out. If you look here at our basic snapshot of the financial position, uh, you'll see not nothing uh, particularly dramatic. Uh, it was overall a year where we lost uh, net assets uh, by a small amount, um, but that's largely because of in actual investment and market conditions, not, not anything out outside of that. Um, if you go to the next page, um, you'll see our, in, that, in that last one, our, our net liabilities and assets, 56 million. Our total end of 16 fiscal year, we're lo looking at uh, 52.3 million. Um, so about 1.4 million below the prior year. Most of that you can see above is uh, in, in our investment side. Um, and that is actually a, a good, healthy place to be in uh, given the close of the year. So we're happy with that, and, um, and that's where we stand. Uh, let's move on to the draft of the quarter. Um, and I will show you the, uh, the first quarter, meaning September 30th numbers. It's actually the fourth document list. It's the fourth attachment. It's a very, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, you're right. It's <laughs> that one right there. Um, so this is just a, a snapshot of where we ended up out of the first quarter. I'll say again, I, I'm happy with where we're at. I, I don't think there's anything particularly dramatic in here. Uh, the first quarter is always a tough um, quarter to use for any kind of judgment, both because it's only 25% of the year, but in our case, it's also the smallest, uh, the least activity of any quarter. Uh, so that's, you're talking about basically the summer, um, and that's when our, our income and donations are the smallest. And it's typically between 10 and 15%. We ended up at about 12% uh, for this first quarter of the year. So it's right, right about normal. Uh, we do have a relative... Uh, increase. First of all, the markets came back, um, and you can see that reflected in these numbers. If you go to the next page, um, Liz, we've got, uh, again, you'll, you'll look there that our total assets rebounded back to um, 56 million, um, but after you look at liabilities and, and in, uh, our net assets there, you'll see that it's about 53.6. So basically recovered what we showed we lost last year, plus some income. Uh, if you look at the actual income report, and this is a few pages on, um, that's our income statement. Uh, actually, that go back. You can go back to that income statement. This will show you what I'm I'm looking to. If you look at total program support, you'll see for the com comparable period last year, uh, from 262,000 to 530,000. So, it's in the right direction. But again, it's such a small percent of the overall year. I, I don't think it it means a whole lot at this point. What that's largely due to is some larger gifts coming in to support the promise, since we're in the launch phase of that. Um, let me stop there and actually ask, are there any questions on those quarterlies? I know you all had a chance to review them in the packet. I don't think there was anything too um, unusual there. No? Nope. All right. Well, then now we'll move on to the fun stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. As you can see in the uh, agenda, there are two additional items that uh, I have the privilege of talking about today. Um, the first is the promise. As you all know, we've launched this, this uh, Fantastic program, if, if we may say so. Uh, and we are now in the position where we can actually share some data. So. First of all, I want to compliment your, uh, the college um, leadership in, in getting this going. We, we acted very quickly here. Um, and so the heads of, of the various departments that were critical to this um, were absolutely critical to making this happen in this amount of time and this well. Um, and that is not to say that it's perfect. We are actually in a constant um, cycle of what's not working, how do we fix it, which I think is a good place to be. Um, but I also want to say that uh, leadership, you know, from the bottom to the top, left to the right, is, is, is outstanding. And, and partnering in particular with our new president, Dr. Beebe, on this um, has been outstanding. He has been a, an incredible booster in the public for us, as you all know and have heard. And uh, I actually couldn't be happier as far as how we're able to talk about this as a partnership between the college uh, and, the, and the foundation. So I think this is sort of exhibit A about how things can work really well together. Um, if we have the opportunity, and we do. So what we wanted to show you now, um, and I, in the audience here is Lucille, the boss from Mirrors, right up there, who is, of course, coordinating on our side, along with uh, Gretchen Hewlett, my, my colleague. Um, and we are, at this point, uh, here's the data that I want to share. First of all, uh, as of, this is as of mid-October, just shy of 750 students. Now, you may remember that in our initial projection, we are looking at about 650. So we're 100 students above what our what we felt was fairly optimistic projections would be as far as who would opt in, who would make the commitment, who would take advantage of the offer. So we're very happy about that. Obviously, the, the um, corollary to that is there are more dollars going to be required, but I'm, that, that number actually is, is not um, in any way uh, troubling to me. It's something we certainly have the ability to do. 
Uh, if you look at, however, the, the first data of who these enrollees are, this is what we've really started to take a look at. We don't have a lot yet, but you can see the average fall unit load is 13.4 units. So remember, we are requiring a full-time student load of 12, uh, with, of course, a handful of exceptions, and we're well above that at 13.4. You can see that these schools, again, we assumed it would be a vast majority of our public high schools. You can see the th big three in the Santa Barbara Unified District or alone make up about 83% of the students. And then, and then if you look at Carpentry, it's another 9%. So you can see 92% are coming from the four large public high schools. Um, but the other eight are really quite a, a spread. And so you have... Um, uh, Bishop Diego is there at 19 students. That's a huge jump from what has been their historic norm of uh, graduates coming to Santa Barbara City College. You can see uh, La Cuesta continuation. You can see a handful of smaller private schools as well as some homeschooling. Uh, and so we're going to watch this carefully and see just how broad we're getting out there and making sure the doors are truly open. Uh, we just had at the SBCEO breakfast the story of a Los Robles graduate from uh, the Boys Camp that actually is enrolled for this spring. So again, uh, another great example of making sure that when we say open access, we mean it, and, and that's uh, proving true. If we go to the next page, we can show you a, a little bit more data. Um, we've started to track what percentage are connected to which college programs. Um, so the more further we go, the more we're going to know, obviously. Um, you can see the BOG waiver. This also makes me very happy from a fundraising perspective. We were counting on the fact that we could maintain the 66% BOG waiver usage uh, rate, which is exactly what we've had a five-year average at. And sure enough, you can see right up there, 66.89%. So we required everyone to at least ask for it. They, uh, they did. And, uh, and sure enough, we've maintained that two-thirds ratio. You can also see who's in which athletic programs, and we're going to have more and more uh, data of other support programs coming soon. About 9% are, are registered with DSPS, and about 13% with various EOPS programs. And then finally, the third page of this report, um, we started to, to measure who is uh, in what majors. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a report that, uh, this whole report is, is something that Lucille is doing regularly. Uh, and the, if you look here at business administration at 78, all the bolded, it's hard to sell the bold on the screen, but it's in your packet. Those are the top uh, majors, business administration, biological sciences um, being two of the largest. And you can see there really is a quite a ways across the spectrum. Uh, and of course, we know that these do change for students as they, as they move on in their, in their coursework. But uh, we are going to be watching this and seeing sort of what is our local cohort that takes advantage of the promise. Uh, do. On the fundraising side, I'll just say that we have crossed the $2 million mark in our fundraising for the promise, which is uh, really makes us happy. Uh, on the way to $5 million is what we need for this, this launch period, the first three years. Uh, we do still aim to have that done by the end of this fiscal year. So that's, that's our goal, is to have those commitments and that cash, com combination of commitments and cash in hand of $5 million by the end of June 30th, 2017. And then it'll give us the runway we need and the, and the, the space we need to prepare for a really what is going to be a massive endowment cam campaign on our part. Um, so I'll take any questions on that and then I'll move to the final highlight. Yes. Oh, go ahead. I was, um, maybe the highlight is what I'm... I'm oh, no, the, I'm ahead. changing the subjects to buildings then. So oh, okay. Well, I, I just wanted to, to ask you about the, the College Promise video and what, what happened with it. Oh, that. I can't believe I didn't say anything throw about you that. Yeah. I'll throw you a softball. Uh, thank you for the, the leading question, uh, <laughs> Dr. Beebe. Uh, so uh, as I think you know, we, we put together a five-minute uh, promotional piece uh, as part of a national competition about our, our uh, program. And uh, we submitted that to a national competition. And uh, two weeks ago, uh, Dr. Jill Biden actually announced that we had won that. Uh, if you have not seen that, I'm hoping everyone sitting here has, but uh, if you haven't, it is now up in a number of places and we're going to put it out again. We will send it out again to campus. Um, it is a really nice piece. We worked with, with Cage Free Productions on that, a uh, local filmmaker, and we feel really good about what they put, it, put together. A number of people in this room are featured in it, uh, and we, uh, we're going to go ahead and, and put that out. We'll have pro I think it has a long shelf life and things like that. That's what you want, so I think we can tell some stories using that, that uh, for some time. And, uh, and in addition to that recognition, we had the opportunity, it was during the course of a conference on Promise programs, and we really did have an opportunity, uh, again, Lucille and myself uh, were there, and talked to a lot about our peer, with our peers and colleagues around the country. And I have to say, uh, you know, we believe that we are really at the cutting edge of this when it comes to a truly broad, open access, full support Promise program, and that's only reconfirmed by these conversations with our colleagues. So we have some, some allies and, and folks to uh, bounce ideas uh, with across the country now and, uh, and to compare data with, and there's actually a, a growing base of study 
um, that's actually measuring these programs and their effects. So there were five academic papers actually released essentially during the time we were there. And uh, so the, the data set about what works and what doesn't is actually getting su fairly substantial, and that's, that's really helpful to us, too. Um, I have a question. Yes. Does anyone else first? Okay. Um, several, if not quite all, but almost all of us are about to go to the annual um, Community College League Conference yes. for trustees and CEOs. And it occurred to me that, um, though I don't see you on the agenda for a session yet, that that might be something that we could do in a future meeting. I will actually be at that one next week. Um, I, well, I guess it overlaps with the one you're discussing, the, the league in, in Riverside. But I was just asked, actually, by uh, Larry Galicio uh, to do a session. Uh, mm -hmm. So James Schulke, who has been the, our national uh, advocate with the, the Heads Up America group working in, in conjunction with the White House, and I were, but he just approached us and said, would you be willing, in, I believe it's in uh, February, to be part of a session? That's all he said. Yeah. But we have been asked to be part of that. Great. Um, so I'm not sure what they have in mind, but we'll definitely uh, share what we know as, as it goes on. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to uh, congratulate you and everybody else on this, because I think it's just absolutely amazing. And the numbers that have shown up are greater than what we thought. So there's an untapped need there that is being fulfilled in some ways. Um, I know that when you make a commitment to go to school, it, it it doesn't solve everything to have your tuition and fees and books, but it sure is the long way. And so um, so that untapped need, it's going to be interesting to see next year if there's even more. I'm not even sure if that's true or not. So, But it, it's interesting to follow it. And I did want to note that the board goals that are up on, on our website, the first goal is for us to support this program, which is like, you know, can you imagine a goal that say, no, we don't support it? So <laughs> it's, it's a good type of goal, I think. So um, I just want to say we really support this. I mean, if anybody wants to speak up and say, oh, no, don't do that. But, you know, I just think it's a really, it's really wonderful to support our community. And that's what this is. So thanks. Thank you for that. I, and, and this is actually something that we're seeing that, that broad-based support that we believe would, would be and could be built it is being built. In fact, I, I'm really... Surpri I won't say surprise. I am very pleasantly surprised by uh, how much support we've gotten and from what corners and, and some of it unexpected. Good. Um, so as, and I believe as we have the opportunity to all, and I don't mean we just the foundation, but all of us go out and speak more about this, I think that's mm -hmm. going to just continue to build uh, because everyone seems very interested in, in making this a success. So. Sure, it's kind of like that turkey for Thanksgiving that we give. You know, I could buy a turkey for a student, a single student. Uh, so I can buy, you know, maybe a semester or something like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, good. Yeah, you can. Good <laughs> well, and to add to that, <laughs> sorry, uh, to add to that, my well, I mean, congratulations. I think the fact that you got them at an average of 3.5 units and you got them to at least identify something they'd like to pursue. And I did notice 27 local teachers that will probably be joining the Santa Barbara Unified School District because they're majoring in ECE. And uh, mm -hmm. Dean talked about that. We talk about, I mean, Dr. Shatsuoka. I mean, that's a constant conversation. How do we develop our workforce here? to support, um, but uh, you know, while you were saying, I got the, I, you know, I was fortunate enough to get a letter from one of the Promise students, and I mean, talk about, ugh, you know, and, and I think you just, you know, you, I heard it once, you know, you give because it feels good, not because it hurts, and, and so if you give it because it feels good, and at that point, it really is, um, it was, I mean, my kids read it, and just to know that there is a student out there right. that, this is a game changer for them. So I'm like, yeah, get that, Juan. So <laughs> hit him up again. <laughs> Good. I think this board, and I know your foundation board, is just tremendously proud of the work that you're doing on this and your partnership with Anthony and both of you working together on this. Absolutely. Yeah, thank thank you. you. We've really had a lot of fun together doing this. And uh, we just went to the Santa Barbara Club and presented to them. And we've been, we're kind of, we kind of go around and do this together. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we can almost read each other's minds to a little bit, to a certain extent, which is kind of scary. It's a little weird. Kind of scary, yeah. <laughs> Very scary. No, weird. we're having fun with it. That's right. That's right. I like it when you bring us all this good news. And I love the data, too. I mean, it's Mr. more Franco, informative. It's going to shift, and I, for, I just want to just stock up my points until we get to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just mean that I'm surprised. I didn't expect to learn these things about, you know, what majors they're interested in and co-curricular and all that, and that's great. So keep it up. Thank you. Peter. One of, the, one of the issues that we talked about when we started thinking about this 
was the idea that this was a free education and mm. there were concerns expressed about that. And the concern was that nothing is ever free, someone has to pick up the tab, and that there are, at least there were on my part, expectations by us of the students that, that they would take this super seriously that this is an outreach by the community for the community. How, how are we getting that message across or is? Well, I, I think there's a lot of room to continue to, I mean, really that's the key is to, sh to explain clearly what this is and how it works. Uh, we, we started with what we needed to start with, which was the link immediately with the high school since we are moving quickly. And so we spent a lot of time with counselors and those going directly into the high schools, including our own staff. Lucille actually spends a great deal of time speaking directly with, with uh, our partners in the, in the K-12 district. Um, in the articles and the, the media that we put out, we might wanted to make that very clear. Um, I think the thing that comes, as far as the students having the, the skin in the game argument, I, I, my answer to that has been the same as it always is, and it, and it seems to be heard once it's explained, which is that skin in the game does not necessarily mean dollars, it, it means commitment, and dollars are one proxy for that commitment, but in, what we're asking is instead time, commitment to a process, and commitment to completion and success through our, what, what we offer. Uh, and that seems to be working and, and heard well. Uh, we have not even begun actually a public fundraising campaign yet. So I, you know, even the dollars I'm telling you about is really from a handful of asks that we're doing of the folks that are closest to us. So we, I think there's a great deal of potential um, going out. The, the one thing we do here, and, and this is the, the notion I have to correct most often, uh, when l overlaid the, the financial conversation that, we, that you just had about a potential $9 million deficit in the coming year, and I've heard comments like, oh, well, I guess they'll rethink that free education thing. Um, and it's a great opportunity to say, actually, it's quite the opposite. What we're doing is asking the community to support this program, which actually s provides some stable enrollment with stable funding through the foundation. So it's not actually costing the college, it's bringing stable enrollment and the dollars that go with it to the college. Um, so that notion has to be talked about. Um, and, but the other is to, to remind people that this is not a public expenditure. This is the, the community rallying around the young people in our, in our community. Uh, and not so young people, it could be folks returning to finish their high school education, um, and that every dollar is, is a voluntary private donation that makes this happen. And once people understand that, we, that's where we get that broad base of support. So. Okay. But we need everybody on, on that, absolutely. Okay, Tom. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, we were the number one community college, and now we're having the number one promise program, so that's a really exciting jump that we didn't just stay stagnant, we went and out and sought out a different way to provide our services and, and it's working. So I'm excited to see where this goes. And I, I guess a question is, how do you see the future of the Promise Program? Like five years, 10 years down the line, where do you see it going? Well, I think if we can prove out this model in, in the way that we're proposing it and, and get some real data over the, and, and the problem with data is it takes time, right? You, you don't know for several years what your completion success rates, et cetera, are. Uh, and I think once we can stabilize that, the, my, my vision is that two things. One, we could add components to it, and that could be um, support for students who are food insecure. It could be support for any number of other needs that this cohort has. Secondly, I'd really love to see us knit it together regionally um, mm -hmm. to help Hancock, uh, the Hancock District in Santa Maria Valley, do something similar, and then to work with our neighbors on both sides, which are really the predecessors of this, of our program at Cuesta um, up in San Luis Obispo mm -hmm. and of course in Ventura. And then you'd have, a, if we had a true regional program on the scale that we're doing it, then you could, you know, we could all send young people back. It would be an exchange program effectively, but mm -hmm. you know, students choose a, a college based on what they're interested in to some extent. So if someone's coming here for our culinary program, they might be going to the you know, police or fire academy up in Santa Maria. So um, that, that's really the long-term hope. That's amazing. And I want to thank you for your social media accounts because I, <laughs> I blame slash thank you, Jonathan, for much yeah. of the attention. <laughs> so the, uh, the continuation of uh, conversation regarding free community housing is huge within um, the millennial generation and especially, you know, students who are um, pursuing higher education. So the fact that um, students on our campus are really seeing a push to from the community um, towards providing them uh, free, and I use free very, you know, um, cautiously, but the fact that they do see that movement um, and that the community is coming and meeting their needs in a community-driven effort uh, is 
is noted by the students and it's seen by the students and it's appreciated by the students because, um, you know, f frankly put, we feel, and I say we, we f and a majority of people I feel like feels as if, you know, higher education is a right and, um, and it should not be limited on financial uh, stability. So again, I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of the students as, you know, Tr tremendous work and the fact that um, it is duly noted by the uh, students, especially as talk has become um, more and more about free community college nationwide as well uh, with the recent election. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I noticed that Emily's using the royal we all of a sudden. It's very good. <laughs> it's nice. But it's good to hear that from the students, that they appreciate it. It's good. All right, well, let me move on to the last final bit of fun good news, uh, and that is the building you see up there. Um, we have purchased it. <laughs> so uh, as many of you know, we have been working on this for a, a few months now. Uh, the idea brought to us uh, as a, a potential partnership, and uh, we were able to close escrow on October 28th for $5.3 million for the former Paul Mitchell the School property. Um, so the foundation has title, uh, took possession of that uh, last week and are now working uh, feverishly alongside uh, you, the district, uh, particularly with, uh, with Julie Hendricks and uh, the uh, structural engineer that you all have a longstanding relationship with as well as uh, the architect, uh, Robert Coles and, uh, and Marcelo Cairo I'm referring to. And uh, we are working to get the building in condition so that uh, you can occupy it and move the cosmetology program into it. So. Uh, we, th this took some creative uh, figuring out, and I know it was in a time of tough economic uh, situations for, for the district, so what we were able to do is find some bridge funding on the foundation side uh, to bridge the distance between the purchase of the building and the rehabilitation needed uh, to work out a lease payment that actually gives the district uh, far more space for a similar price to what you've been paying. Uh, and a much higher quality space, and not to mention a better location. I'm really looking forward to seeing what can happen when our cosmetology program is in the downtown core. Um, and there, it, it was just g good luck that uh, there was a cosmetology school on the market, and there was a market of one who wanted to buy a cosmetology <laughs> school. Uh, so we're really looking forward to celebrating this with the community. You may have seen and or heard, actually, in the last 24 hours, a number of uh, stories on this. So Pacific Coast Business Times ran a nice piece, The Independent ran a nice piece, today KCLU has been airing a, a report about it, uh, so people are talking about this and what it could do uh, for the relationship with the community and of course again highlighting our CTE programs and what what they do um, and the students in them. So we look forward to many more things and again I want to thank um, Dr. Beebe and, and, and Dr. Gerald both for working uh, with me to figure out how to make this happen along with uh, Melissa Moreno Dean overseeing this program and just really figuring out uh, with Joe Sullivan and Julie Hendricks and the designers and architects and everybody, how do we make this happen given the time frame? And, and I'm really excited that we did. I think it's a great investment for us, uh, a great program space for the college and, uh, and a great example of how we can leverage the assets we have in a new way. So any questions on that about calendar and such? We'll, uh, okay, I'll give you a little <laughs> There's, uh, other than the pretty pictures, I'm not sure what else I put in there, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, oh, there you go, data. <laughs> so, 10,000 square foot building. Before, yes, before the sellers took everything with them, it looked like that, but <laughs> we'll, we'll work on that part. So. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, that's, Jeff. Uh, that's a lot of good news, and we're happy to have it. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, well, we have taken some big chunks of the agenda, <laughs> but we're still at uh, or back to item six. <laughs> and uh, that's communications. So we have a report from Priscilla. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. Beebe. Um, the last time I made a report uh, to the board, I was talking about faculty hiring, and that's what I'm going to be talking about again tonight. But I'd like to frame it through the lens of student access and success. And um, a little piece of background information, this is the first week of registration <coughs> for spring semester. And so we're only in day four. We started on Monday. And we have classes that are closed because they're fully enrolled. Now, it's not a large number of classes, but we're two months out. 
Um, I'm highlighting that because I want to make it clear that although we have had this enrollment decline, that decline does not exist universally at the college. We have departments and programs that have had uh, either steady enrollment or in some cases uh, higher enrollment than compared to a few years ago. And that's really important, I think, in the context of faculty hiring. Um, I know, you know, I kind of liken it when we're talking about budget discussions. I remember some years ago I was working for another institution and uh, the public and faculty and staff, I mean, many people were complaining because we were erecting a building during this time and the college was in a budget crisis and they said, how can you do that? And they didn't understand that the funding mechanism was through a different source. So I'm, I'm mentioning that because I think similarly, someone might, some member of any group might say, how can you hire faculty when we've just spent you know, over an hour focusing on the dire budget times that we're in? And it's because this is in some measure the way out. I mean, our classes that we offer to students, of course, our primary uh, purpose is to give them access to the education they come here to pursue. Um, but also that's how we generate revenue. And so this is a really important consideration. I also wanted to, uh, I know the board members know this, but I think there might be, you know, one, possibly two other people who watch these broadcasts. So, <laughs> no, it's larger, but um, one thing that I'm not sure everybody is aware of is that when we have a hiring cycle for faculty, generally we, we make one attempt in a year. We have a one-year hiring cycle. And um, not every year are we able to find uh, the best qualified faculty to fill those positions. So in the past, we've made a commitment to hiring committees that we don't want to hire people because they're the only people available and we want to fill a position. We want to hire the best faculty so that students have access to the best education that they can get. And so last year, there were five of the approved, ranked, and funded positions that we did not fill because we wanted to uphold that standard for faculty hiring. And so those five positions, the Academic Senate spent an hour yesterday of our meeting talking about what is our position, what is our recommendation that we wanted to bring to Dr. Beebe um, about how to treat those five positions. And the Senate uh, voted to support that those five unfilled positions um, be able to go out again without an additional ranking or approval process because we want to stand by the commitment to finding the very best faculty for our positions. And so when I'm talking about those five, uh, you know, to my mind, those are not, when we talk about the total numbers of faculty to hire, those five are not part of the set because they are faculty we had already, we had budgeted for, um, we had planned to hire. So when I'm excluding those five and now talking about the number of faculty that we really need, as an additional piece of background, we had 19 people who by the SERP deadline um, had submitted their uh, notice that they would be either retiring or resigning this year. It's likely that we'll have a few more by the time the, the actual deadline comes, but we know we have 19 who are most likely going to retire. We had 23 position requests, and there are a few that are new position requests because those programs have had growth at, that some other areas did not. Um, so total, 23 position requests. We are very clear we're not going to be hiring 23 faculty, right? We know that. But I think it's uh, very important to recognize that if we do not hire some number of these positions, there will be departments that cannot offer the same number of sections that we currently do. And there are departments right now with the current level of staffing who cannot keep as many classes open as students need. That number of departments is small, but it is there and it's important to fill that need. So um, I know that you know, Dr. Beebe is carefully considering all of the information that he's gotten both from our EVP and from the Academic Senate and I'm sure many other uh, sources that he's looking at to evaluate that ultimate decision about how many faculty to hire. But I wanted to um, 
reiterate and reaffirm the Academic Senate's uh, position on the five faculty who were unfilled positions last year and also draw attention to the fact that if we don't hire some number of the 23 ranked positions, then our institution will suffer in terms of both the courses that we offer and the revenue that we're able to generate. And so I wanted to um, end by saying that, you know, that whatever final number it is, we n I've had really good conversations with both Dr. Jarrell and Dr. Beebe about this, and I, I trust that the decision will be a good one. Um, but I want, I want everybody <laughs> to, to recognize that we need to invest in our faculty to invest in this institution and to invest in our students. And uh, I think it was Michelle who was giving the FICMAT report who said that when we make budget decisions, we make decisions about the future and we need to invest in the future. Thank you. Any questions, anyone? Um, no, other than I just, I wanted to echo that. I also, you know, I trust Dr. Beebe and Dr. Drell and I think what I've heard and I think we've all heard is that these are gonna be uh, recommendations to hire are going to be based on need and department. I think where we come in, and, and this is something that I think I just, I, so everybody understands, is that also as we're looking at the policy level at enrollment and what that portfolio of demographic of student looks like and what the community need is, I mean, goodness, we could all of a sudden have cosmetology, you know, now take off because now they're downtown and that's the go-to now. I mean, who knows, right? So I think that for us, you guys are one part and then our part is to look at, well, what is the college gonna look at and what is that community need? Just how, um, I forget her name, the gal said, some colleges will Michelle. say, oh, let's just have these classes because the professor recruited these students or has all these students, but what does the community need? What do What is our student population telling us and stuff? So I appreciate all your legwork and all the different groups on campus that are really moving forward to uh, to think about this in, in, a, in a really good way that brings recommendations to us that are thought out and are not just looking at one piece, but looking at the whole picture. So thank you. Anthony? Yeah, I just wanted to thank Dr. Butler for uh, her advocacy for the faculty. And I also wanna thank her for her leadership in the Academic Senate. Um, Y'all that are listening to this from the faculty ranks need to know that she is an incredible advocate for you. and. Uh, does just an excellent job. And I also want to thank the, the faculty, Academic Senate, um, for the hard work that they've done and the very uh, fastidious uh, analysis that they've done uh, in terms of ranking faculty, determining uh, which faculty should be in what order. And uh, it's a very, uh, very uh, granular process that you've gone through and one that has taken a lot of thought. and. I just want to thank you for what you've done with that. And we'll come up with a decision here shortly, I'm sure. Yeah, I would add my thanks as well, listening to you. Um, these are tough decisions. And having this input of the Academic Senate and the framework in which you are thinking about it is helpful to all of us. So. Thank you. I have a question. No, no it's, it's not a question, it's a comment. <laughs> I, I just want to compliment the faculty in the Academic Senate especially for not moving forward and hiring. If, if you don't find the perfect person, that, uh, then that person doesn't belong here. Yeah. And, uh, and I certainly don't want to do anything that incentivizes uh, hiring the wrong person. I think the, the kind of judicious uh, focus of hiring committees really essential to maintaining the standards that we've had at Santa Barbara City College for a very long time. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not seeing Dylan. Is, is there? I see Do, uh, Emily? They, they left for uh, General Assembly. Okay. So he's on his way. So we will hear from him next time, we hope. Liz? <coughs> Good afternoon, members of the board. Uh, nice to see you back, Madam President. Uh, 
Our group has only met once since the last board meeting, and we've spent the whole meeting discussing the um, <coughs> results from the work groups of CPC Plus, the first round of it. There'll be another round of it, and we went over with our group in detail every single one of the plans. Yeah, there's not really feedback yet because they haven't been finalized. Um, I wanted to add that uh, I agree with Priscilla that it's very important to have good fa faculty because that's where the revenue comes, but it's also important to have staff to get the people in the classes and to take care of the buildings and take care of the grounds and get the students the aid they need. And we're going to reach a time when, with the SERP and with other people leaving, that we're going to not be able to fill lots of, of classified and management positions. And there's going to have to be a lot of work done to try to organize ourselves so we can still get the work we have to get done and then decide what work maybe we can't do anymore. If you're losing a lot of staff and a lot of managers, there may be stuff you can't do anymore. And you may have to reorganize so that you can do as much as you can with what you've got left. So I just wanted to add that. Most of the people in the room already know that's going to be happening, but I just want to let you know there's <laughs> going to be a lot of work to be done. I don't know how many staff are planning to take the cert, but I know that we've already have managers of left or leaving and staff that are maybe not retired but leaving and or getting promoted and their positions aren't being filled. So we have a lot of work to do on our hands. So you may be hearing more about that as mm -hmm. time goes on. <laughs> Well, thank you, Liz. I'm, I'm sure we anticipate that there will be a complex and collaborative process on this. Very much so. Okay. Anthony, your turn. Of course, we uh, had elections uh, yesterday, and uh, several positive things came about relative to education um, in that election. Uh, the Unified School Districts measure, uh, measures I and J passed. We had Prop 55, which is an extension of the income tax portion of Prop 30, passed. By the way, that represents $9 million to our budget. Uh, Prop 30 was $11 million, um, but if you subtract out the, the sales tax portion, which, ex which will expire, um, that leaves us with $9 million that Prop 55 will add to our budget. Prop 58, which permits bilingual education in schools, uh, passed. Prop 51, which is a statewide bond uh, for $9 billion, passed. And so there were, there were some good news for, for schools across the state of California and here in Santa Barbara, and so I'm happy to be able to report that. I do also want to make a, a comment, I had a chance to speak with some of our underprivileged students, um, those from uh, the communities, the black community, the, the Hispanic community, vets, disabled students, other students that have felt disenfranchised because of some of the rhetoric that's come out of the campaign. Uh, for those students, I want, I want them to know that uh, Santa Barbara City College is a haven for them and that we, we do not want them to be afraid, and we want them to be able to uh, reach out to us and feel comfortable doing that, and for, for us to be able to have resources available for those students. And, and uh, I know that I speak for, for everybody at the college in terms of uh, being aware that students are concerned, um, and in some cases afraid, uh, for what might happen to them or their family um, in the future, and so I just wanted to, to let you know that we're taking action. Uh, I know uh, Vice Pre Executive Vice President Jarrell and I both mentioned that our doors are open, and I know that's true for, for faculty and, and staff and other managers at the college. Uh, for any student that feels uncomfortable, just wants to talk, um, we're available. So that's the end of my report. Okay. Thank you, Anthony. and, and uh, I know we want to support all of our students uh, as uh, whatever their concerns. So that's that's important. Um, board reports are next. Anybody have anything they particularly want to report? Jonathan. Yes, uh, there were over 13,000 votes cast in Isla Vista on Tuesday, which is a 
massive record breaking. It was 11,000 was the previous one. So a lot of people did vote. Um, and the self-governance measures, measure E passed, measure F is still up in the air. They're we'll still find counting? Out What's They're still counting. Yeah, there's like uh, 1,100 provisionals left to count. Oh. Yeah, so. okay. And it's a very close vote still. You know, I commented to Dr. Jarrell, but I just wanted to say uh, thank you to our staff. And I received a lot of very positive comments of our staff being out at the secondary level and just the genuineness of how they're interacting with our community. And it was noticed and appreciated by the students um, just how authentic um, our administrators, I mean, our, our VPs are interacting with our youth. And so I thought that that was pretty awesome that people are taking time to send us these messages. So thank you, Dr. Beebe, um, for getting our people out of here and out there and vice versa. I think it's great. Well, you were among the people who attended the Salute to Our Teachers on uh, Saturday, and Marianne and I were all there. Um, that's a K through 12 event, Paul and his wife, and Anthony and Carolyn. Um, and I felt just great about being there and um, kind of that partnership aspect with our K-12 folks. Um, so I'd also mention yesterday's um, Durante's lecture which a number of us were able to attend, and that is, um, it's just a wonderful annual event. It is um, something that I look forward to every year. I think it's very special uh, that we have that event and that we continue that tradition and the statement that it makes for our community and for ourselves. Marianne. Marianne. I just wanted to say thank you for that event <coughs> and also how very proud I am to be part of an institution mm -hmm. that does <coughs> that kind of event. Mm -hmm. It's um, timely and very important for our student, but I think important for all of us who are there. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, now we go to the development of the consent agenda, and for folks who are not familiar with this, which are the two people that Priscilla referenced who look at the tapes, um, <laughs> we develop a consent agenda here made up of the items that are routine, non-controversial, not in need of any further explanation to the board. Um, we get it already. And these items in the total agenda um, are put in one basket and we vote on them together. And then any items that we want to pull out and e any board member can say, well, I'd like to hear more about this item. Uh, we pull those out and we discuss and vote on them separately. So what we're looking at here is from item, we're talking about developing the agenda in under item seven and then we have human resources. Um, and we have educational programs, which includes the academic calendar, stipends for faculty, and we have business services all the way up to, but not including, the um, resolutions, because resolutions we vote on as individuals, and Angie records that. So we are going up through, um, up to 11.2, we've done 11.1, so that takes us through 10.3, basically. Does anyone have anything they want to pull out from that group uh, and discuss? Well, I just have one comment, uh, but I don't need it to have a pull. The academic calendar is sometimes problematic, and we've had to send it back, or we've had to amend it, and so on, but I couldn't find anything on this one. Um, I really looked at it because I thought, you know, that's kind of an embarrassment when you come back and find out, oh my God, they have to come back on a Monday, you know, from whatever it is, but that kind of thing. I mean, they uh, finish on a Monday or something. But uh, I did note that the, this year the, um, there will be um, winter break from December 10th to January 10th. And I think I'm reading that right. And so that, that seems like kind of a longish one, but I, you know, it's good. I think it's wonderful because some people always take that anyway. So it's kind of, you know. Actually, I think it's run later in January in the past. Are we moving it that has, part It has, but up? I think this is fine, it, but it's a month, which is, you know, sometimes people like to go away or go back. Right. You know, to all kinds of places, so it's good. 
Trust me, this has been discussed and <laughs> <we> discussed, <laughs> and pe that has come up. I mean, okay. so we've considered that, but it's very uh, observant of you yeah. to, to bring that up. No, but. it's it's. I think it's a good one. Sometimes you only have three weeks, and mm -hmm. you know. But anyway, I think it's good this time. Okay. We'll see. Yeah, I do I have the impression words. the academic calendar yeah. here has been discussed, yeah. uh, perhaps <laughs> more than anyone <laughs> wanted you don't to. Need to both <laughs> separately. Yeah, I know. So, okay. I do have, Madam Chair. I have. Uh, uh, one correction that I'd like to make. Um, Matt, Matt uh, Cedillo, mm -hmm. um, in the HR uh, listing, was listed as being funded by auxiliary, and in fact, he's funded by, by, right. by a grant. And I just wanted to clarify that for the record, Angie. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm not hearing anybody pull anything out, so I'm looking for a motion to approve um, all of these items, and I should have written it down. Peter, you're making the motion? I am going to move that we place items 7.1 through 10.3, excluding 10.1 because we've already covered it, uh, on the consent agenda. Oops. You mean no, that was 11.1 we've covered, yeah. so up to 10.3 we're good. Okay, 10.3. Yeah, and I actually don't think we have to <coughs> vote on 7.1 and 7.2. We're no. developing it, and now we are voting to approve all these items because we have not. Am I doing this right? Right, you're doing yeah. it perfectly right. Yeah. Um, we have not pulled any of them out, so we're, we're approving the personnel ones and so forth, um, and the business services and the uh, academic ones. I'll second so. it. Marty seconds? <laughs> that was a long. I know, it was a long explanation, but we'll get better at this. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we zip through. Now we go to the resolution, which is um, augmentation of revenue 11.2. Angie? Well, I need a, a motion. Oh, yeah, you do need a motion. <laughs> motion to approve augmentation of revenue. So I moved. so moved. Second. Marty seconds, okay. Trustee Bloom? Aye. Trustee Kugler? Aye. Trustee Abood? Aye. Trustee Gallardo? Aye. Trustee Kugler? Oh, I said that a name already. Oh, sorry. <laughs> she, she does not get two twice. votes. <laughs> <laughs> Trustee Carninger? Aye. Did I, uh, Trustee Haslund? Yeah. Aye. <laughs> Trustee, student Trustee Gribble. 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 Oh, that's okay. Sorry. Aye. Aye. <laughs> We're getting tired. Yeah. Okay, so that passed, and I think we are uh, set. So we can adjourn. No, number 12. Oops, dude. <laughs> I'm sorry, Marty. I just had two things just um, for future. I don't know whether it's this, you know, this year or the beginning of next year, but one of our goals is housing, to look into housing for students and support efforts to explore student housing. And it dawned on me when I was in Italy, which is crazy, but sometimes your mind goes there. And um, that we could just find out maybe by zip code where our students are actually living. We might even already have that information. Yeah, I think we, we do have that information. Okay, and that would be interesting for us to have a report on that so that then we could start talking about, you know, exploring different ways to get them to move closer or whatever it is that we want them Dr. to Dr. Jarrell has a comment on that. Oh, okay. Part, part Okay, yeah, I know. So, so, so it's sometimes a little bit different, but I'll look into it further. Yeah, okay. okay. And then the other thing is that the PLUMP report, which was the uh, program land, oh, d I was going to remember it. Uh, land, no, program. We know what the PLUMP report is. Location and land yeah. use, master yeah. planning. Well, we did it together. Um, I think we're all done with that. I mean, I think we really worked hard on it, and the only thing we're missing is a report. Am I right? Because I know they did all kinds of public hearings and so on. And if all we're missing is a pub is the report, isn't that something no, we should ask we, for? We, um, you may want yeah. to explain, Anthony, but I think we did some cost saving on that remaining piece of it, but we're doing the facility management plan. Yeah, the facility master plan is yeah. the remaining component on that. Okay. 
and uh, we're currently um, actually getting some bids by some firms that can that can work on that final piece for us. Well, oh, okay. So there'll be a report out. You're absolutely right. Okay. We need to get a report to you on yeah, that. Yeah, I didn't want to drop it because we worked so hard on it. And oh, no, it's good work. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thanks for reminding me of that. Thanks, sir. Jonathan. Yes, uh, Marty's comment reminded me that we do have our impact committee that and we yes, will, we've we all been busy. I've, I've been busy as well, too, the past <laughs> month. So yeah. I'm looking forward to yeah. getting that started I think, again. I think we should get that one going again. A yes. Emily? Uh, again, to touch on the uh, impact committee, uh, the ASG has decided as well to um, uh, create an ad hoc committee in the okay. same this in the same um, aspect that we have as well, <coughs> and they um, will be requesting funds for um, research and development on campus to figure out which way the students. Um, would feel housing would best be directed and then again where are they living how much is the average rent uh, how many people are in your house so surveys and field research will be being sent out from the ASG um, and we will be requesting uh, funds for that not this Friday but the following so oh, well, it's, that's really All interesting right. we're yeah. we'll be interested in what you learn yeah. So. Yeah. Absolutely. okay anything else mm -hmm. folks all right, now we're adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>